Good morning and welcome back to today's Go Far Fast show, the small business talk show that gets you, our community, the answers you most want to the burning questions of today. Fast. I'm Merle and I'm here once more with my trusty co-host Aaron. How you doing buddy? Yeah, really well. Thank you Merle and I can't wait for this show. It's going to be a cracker. No, exactly. As always, massive thank you to the National Enterprise Network for sponsoring the show and making it possible. And Aaron's right. We have a cracking topic to discuss today with probably the best person to interview on this subject as well, haven't we, Aaron? Can you tell us a bit more? Certainly, Merle. So today we have the pleasure of having on the show the one and only Kevin Hollinray, who is a Conservative MP and a member of the Parliament since 2015. He is a member of the All-Party Parliament Group and is especially involved in fair business banking, which during this past year has been a hot topic. One of the key topics that we want to cover today and dive a little bit deeper into the future of banking and fair, fair finance, how business can thrive. I'm sure you can all agree we can't wait to find out more. Well, let's not leave the audience waiting any longer and get our expert guest on the line ASAP. Kevin, welcome to the Go Far Fast Show. Fantastic. Well, we've got a few questions that come through from that we want to go through first of all. And our first big question is, as well as being an MP for your chair of the all-party parliamentary group of Fair Business Banking, whose main purpose is to put forward policy recommendation to government that encourage a finance system that allows enterprise to flourish and business to thrive. Can you tell us a little bit more about the role of an MP and the aims of the APPG, which is a far better way of explaining that acronym, and how is it that have been 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 helping business, especially small business, to flourish? I guess a big question wrapped up on all of this is how can the government listen to small businesses? Yeah, well, thanks for inviting me on. Um, I mean, just to step back in 2015, for... The 20 years prior to that, I've been in business, so I'm delighted to talk to you and to your audience because business has been my life, it's my passion. I absolutely believe that um, business, and I'm talking about business, I'm not talking about huge businesses, I'm talking about SMEs that are the <clears throat> lifeblood of the country, they make the economy dynamic, they drive down prices, drive up service, so vital for our economy. But I think we pay lip service to business a lot in here. So, um, so moving from business into politics, a lot of people would say, well, why would you do that? I say, I've built a business up from a small business to a national business over 20 years. I'm still chairman now. But um, I was opt out. I wanted to, get, like most business people, we're in it for change, we're in it for legacy as well as trying to build something for ourselves. And um, and this is a nice legacy to have, some thinking you change things at a fundamental level. So an MP is, is really, most of the time, of course, you kind of lobby fodder. You are there to walk through the lobbies at the right time when the whips tell you. So, um, and lots of people say, tell you when you go into politics, you can't change anything. And then what's the point? But you've had a successful business career, what's the point? And I don't believe that, actually. I think I've been surprised. I knew it would be difficult to get change, and it is, but it's easier than, easier than I thought. So MPs are all about trying to drive change. And, um, and what the key things to do that are very similar to the principles of business, you're, um, you're trying to build a, a compelling case for something, a compelling problem, a compelling solution. You've got to build a coalition of people around that particular solution. And then you've just got to be constant. You've got to constantly bang on about whatever you're talking about. So, um, so it's really about driving change. It's really about the fundamental conditions for business are that you want a fair and level playing field. That's what you want. So a lot of what we do is trying to create a fair and level playing field between businesses and banks, and we know that a very iniquitous relationship because they're so powerful in the UK. When things go wrong, businesses can get very, very badly caught in the crossfire. So um, we do lots trying to make sure that um, the, the business environment for finance particularly, which is probably the most critical thing for business, is a fair one and that businesses can get access to finance when they start up and scale up. It's a huge job. Kevin and it's, a, it's I always think it's fascinating because banks really are like the barometers of when something's going right and when something's going wrong so I think you, you sit right at the core of that knowledge with the the role that you play both as an MP because you can see what's happening in the community but also in relation to the all-party parliamentary group as well um 
in your report, Kevin, um, and, and, and you're sort of prolific in the way that you communicate knowledge and information, which I think is fantastic. I wish we had more of that, actually, from, from people representing us in government. But you, you have a report called Fair Business Banking for All, which was published with the Centre for Policy Studies uh, not too long ago. And you make a big point of highlighting the importance, in particular, of small businesses for the UK economy. And just to remind everybody, you know, small businesses make up 99.9% .9 of businesses within the UK. That's whopping. Last year, we contributed $2.2 trillion to the UK economy. So we might be small, but as we always like to say at Virilio and Boffick, small is mighty. But Kevin, this year's economic contributions from small businesses are unlikely to hit those hallowed levels of, of, of last year. And lots of high-performing, really well-run businesses have actually been crippled by current events. And staying open, keeping cash flows above the red line, you know, continues to be a massive challenge even for the very best of our UK small businesses. So how do you think the banking sector can really help our small businesses to stay mighty and to power through COVID. What more needs to be done, do you think? Because the, the Chancellor is very clear, it can't just be about loans. That's true, but Ecorelli has used most of his power, power, power as well in terms of grants, job retention yeah. scheme, business rates grants. Um, you know, I think we've took about 168 billion of business so far uh, in, in, um, in those areas, 300 odd billion in total, because there's obviously tax receipts are way down. So, and there's there's not much left in the locker, to be honest. So I think most businesses now are gonna to have to restructure their businesses um, to, to write and cope with the, with the future. And this may well be live with us for six to 12 months. I think as Rishi said the other day on the floor of the house, we're gonna to have to live without fear, but live with the virus. So I think most people should be thinking, okay, this, Current situation, local lockdowns going to be with us for 12 months. How are we going to get through this? Cut our cloth accordingly. Um, what, what, uh, what banks, two big things that banks need to do is to get money out the door in terms of loans quickly. So the processes have got to be good, they've got to be fair, and they've got to make sure that their administration processes are good. Generally, banks back loans and coronavirus business interruption loans, which many of your uh, your members will have uh, will have accessed have been delivered pretty well, pretty quickly, pretty well. Good scheme by the government. Eventually, we had a lot of input on that. The Batman's Fat Loans were, were an afterthought, really. We needed them initially, not afterthought, really. Anyway, 1.3 million loans later, we were told there's no demand for those loans. Anyway, 1.3 million loans later, um, you know, so lots of businesses have access to those. So they need to continue with those. They've been extended already to the end of November. We think this needs to be extended through the whole of 2020, maybe in a 2021, maybe in a slightly different form. So we need to continue access to finance because lots of businesses who have not yet accessed those schemes will hit cash flow difficulties. Every business that some will. The other thing they need to do is make sure we we do things differently than we did in, two, in post 2008, where the banks came in and just took apart SMEs when they try to restructure their own balance sheets, they actually uh, put a lot of businesses to the sword in the process. Really unfairly, poor communication, no proper chance to get themselves back on the feet or find alternatives. So we need a proper code of conduct. If businesses hit cash flow difficulties, they need to restructure the loan payment for a longer period, payment holidays. We need a standard process for that. We're, we're pushing the Treasury on this. They are working on that. So we know that banks will follow the process. And because of some of the work we've done, uh, business, as I'm sure your members know, business lending, business finance is not regulated. Book 25K is not regulated. So banks, when they decide to pull the finance back off, you can do it almost with a sweep of a pen, almost instantly. So, um, so there's no requirement even to try to treat a customer fairly during that process, fairly or reasonably in that process. So we need banks to treat people fairly and reasonably. Now we've got an expansion of the financial ombudsman service that will look after businesses used to only 1.8 billion turnover, now up to 6.5 million turnover. And above that, up to 10 million, there's a new service called the Business Bank Resolution Service. We've been um, big advocates of those reforms, delighted to say that reforms have been brought forward. So it means businesses up to 10 million quid turnover will have access to an independent resolution body that does judge their bank's actions on a fair and reasonable basis. So it is kind of regulated. 
now. That's the good news. So there are more protections for businesses through what will be a very difficult time. Yeah, I think that's brilliant. And it's absolutely brilliant, don't you, Aaron? Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, I really emphasise what you're saying there about how crucial the bounce back loans have been. Um, we, we've seen so many in, in the community that me and Merle are involved in of how much that's kept those businesses alive and at this time through the crucial and as, as you kind of pointed out it's not just about just giving out grants but the the loans themselves have been a lifeblood of what they've gone and it's really important that what you're saying there about the fact that there is going to be some regulation and there is some regulation now and i think i think we've shown and, and we've kind of demonstrated that you know it, it is down to the business themselves to be mindful of what they're taking on and the credit risk and everything else. But, the, you know, they need that bank support as well to go with it. Um, I don't mean any business, well, most businesses out there will just go out and just willy-nilly go and get some credit. It's all about that they've normally got a reason for it. They've normally took professional advice and, you know, having that regu- regulatory there so that they can, you know, hopefully achieve what they need to achieve and, and keep the business going is so important. Uh, just on that kind of similar project or, or point, though, um, I don't think UK is alone in all this, is it? I think there's uh, there might be or there must be lessons to be learned from abroad. Um, are there any other countries handling fair business banking and the crisis that small businesses uh, must be equally facing? There is there anything we can learn from there? Is there anything we can take on board? Totally, and uh, I hate to say it because well as we, when things go wrong here, we always point. we always point to Germany how well we're doing things, and I'm testing you can say that, but business finance is the same. Uh, UK is really unique in its concentration of market share with the big four banks. 80% of SME finance is with the big four banks. And um, what we saw post 2008, between 2008 and 2013, we saw a 25% reduction in the availability of finance, in fact, the lending, net lending to SMEs from the big banks. 25% reduction. In, in Germany, <clears throat> the banking sector is mainly mutual banks. So regional mutual banks, and there are 1,500 of them, who uh, are not for profit, not affected by shareholders' interests, and that's why we saw the contraction of lending from banks post 2008. And so during that five-year period in Germany, they saw a 35% increase in lending to SMEs. Because then you need it. It's at those times you need it. It's the old umbrella gag. It's where you know the bank gives you the umbrella when it's sunny and then takes it away when it's raining. And that's the opposite of what we need. And so what we need, desperately need to do is have a banking sector that's not just dependent on the big four banks, regional mutual banks, and um, massive in uh, USA, massive in Japan, massive in Canada, massive in Germany. All the leading economies have them. We used to have them. We invented them, and we got rid of them all. Crazy. We need a completely different system that is a, has a much more benevolent approach, a much more patient approach to businesses when things get tough. It's too late to do that for this crisis. So the government's had to step in with the support of the balance back loans and civil loans, but um, and these other, other these other forbearance measures to kind of put a sticking plaster over it. But once this crisis is over, what should be working right now is to set up a proper mutual banking sector on a regional basis that can really deliver great support for SMEs who wouldn't then be, because as an SME, I know it's like you're always looking over your shoulder and thinking, is the bank going to foreclose on me if I don't get numbers this month or this quarter? That's the last thing you want in this business. You should have a confident, good, long-term relationship with your bank, and that's one of the solutions. I couldn't agree more, and I think <clears throat> it's interesting, isn't it, Aaron? In, in these times, so many more of us, especially the new business community, seem to have a more and more remote relationship with our banks as time goes on. And I know there are a couple of questions from the community specifically on the relevance of, of banks to, to businesses these days and that relationship. So I'll park that question for, for now. But I think it's really interesting coming back to what you were saying a moment ago. Um, and I, I know from the website for, for the all-party parliamentary group that you talk about levelling the playing field between businesses and lenders. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because that's fascinating. How do you level this, this playing field? How do we get closer to a Germany-style model, for example? Yeah, I mean, it's really not easy. And... Um... But it's simple, but it's not easy. And the two things are completely different things, of course, simple and easy. But um, um, so I think in terms of the sticking plaster is the work we've done in terms of dispute resolution. So you've got least, you've got rid of this uh, nonsense. Effectively, I'm banking. When you, if you go to court with a bank, 
the judge will the judge they will make a judgment on the basis can't make a judgment on the basis of whatever's written in the agreement you sign. In the agreement you sign, you probably don't read all the small print like we don't, but it probably says in there something like, even if the bank acts um, uh, is guilty of malpractice, is guilty of, uh, of egregious behaviour, it cannot be made, found guilty of that in the court. I mean, they literally exclude themselves from any wrongdoing in the contract. So you get to a court, if you try and sue a bank, there's no fair and reasonable test in that contract you sign. You pull the finance at any point, you're going to lose in court. That's pre pretty much the case. So um, we need an alternative dispute resolution. That's why we've got financial ombudsman service and the business bank resolution service. There's two things that does. A, it gives business somewhere to go when things go wrong. But more importantly, it stops the banks doing the wrong thing in the first place. This time we are watching. This time we'll have a code of conduct. This time we'll have a, a process that will judge whether the banks follow that code of conduct or not. So the chance of people getting, getting um, taken apart by the banks is much, much lower. And, and it's, it's all this, sorry to interrupt you, Kevin, but this sounds fantastic. It's all this live right now. This is happening today. Yeah. Yes, so the financial ombudsman already hears now cases up to £6.5 million turnover, used to £1.8 million. Pounds. And the Business Fact Resolution Service is going through its live pilot. I've been sat on the steering group for just about two years. And um, it opens for cases in the middle of November. So most businesses will be able to go somewhere if you up to, up to £10 million quid turnover. From there, from there. Uh, in terms of mutual banks, what we need to do with that is we need the government to step in and, and the regulators to be have a slightly different regulatory regime. These mutual banks do not have the same systemic risk as the big banks, therefore, the regulatory burden should be slightly lower. Often, they need some capital. We need to pump prime those banks with some money so that they can set up and start lending to SMEs and will produce a return. It's not risky because they're lending to sensible businesses, they've got a sensible business plan and, um, and is demonstrably good returns. Banks that operate on this basis, that handles banks, they're not mutual, but they operate on this very sensible lending uh, kind of approach, not a kind of roller coaster ride that banks have followed in the past, are very profitable. Them. It's something we should be investing in, we should use taxpayers' money to pump prime it, it'll come back in dividends. Yeah, I think that's really powerful what you said there, especially that part about businesses being in fear of what could happen if they don't keep up with, you know, getting the reports in on time and making these KPIs and all that sort of stuff that really can start stifle a business and kind of, like you said, make them live in fear. And I think really, you know, what you're saying there about the idea that if we can get that lending to to, to the small businesses on the right terms and make sure, you know, there's a good business plan and they've got that right mm. um, forward thinking. I think that's going to be really powerful because that's going to in encourage them. It's going to give them that that sensibility that, you know, they've got the bank, the, the backing of the banks and they've got the ability yeah. to go out there and push forward. And that's what yeah. we need. The economy needs it, doesn't it? So the more we can... I mean, bang, always said before, it's all remote. You know, when I was a kid growing up, my dad banked the local bank manager, he was part of the community, he knew my dad, knew his good risk, knew he'd always pay his money back. Suddenly, so now to credit committees, where I've been in front of a credit committee in 2008 with our business, it was traumatizing. And they, you know, they listen to all your story and you, how you just. I remember one day I went to see the, the credit committee and we explained what we've done and uh, all the way, actions we've taken. And we just made, I think we made 135 people redundant over a six month period, which cost us a fortune. And uh, at the end of it, we explained all the stuff we've done. And the, at the end of the Conversations, right? Okay, I'm, right, that's all fine. We'll support you a bit more, but I'm putting your interest rate from two percent of a base to three percent of a live roll, which cost us six grand a month. And I was saying, I've just made two people redundant today. Two, I work with for best uh, over ten years in our business. They've had to go back and tell their family that they've lost the job. And um, and what you're saying, effectively, is that savings I made to try and save my business. That's what I'm giving to you. How is that going to help my business right now? And this is the attitude. The, the patient capital doesn't exist. It, the, the, the banks look too much towards their shareholders and not enough to their customers. I think that's so, so true. Um, it, it's quite scary, actually, just how remote banks feel, just how unfeeling that relationship often feels and how much times have changed, as, as you say, Kevin. 
Um, it's it's extraordinary. Aaron, I know you had a question on this fair business banking, Mark, to, to put to Kevin. Before we turn to our viewers' questions, we can see them banking up. Um, I think it's really worth discussing that too. Yeah, because it's, it's still about confidence, isn't it? And, you know, we need to get confidence in small businesses. So just on that fair banking, um, we saw on the fair banking website that there is something called a fair banking mark that banks can voluntarily sign up to. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this mark, which banks have it, and how effective the mark is at ensuring fairness and confidence as well with the with the small businesses? Yeah, it's, it's really more... Um, it, I, I, it's a great idea, a great concept. It's not one of our, it's our initiative, but it's a great concept. But um, it's merely, merely aimed at the personal banking side rather than business banking side. But we absolutely need something for the business banking side like that. You know, it's um, it's frightening. The most frightening thing, most people in business think, well, you've, you've got to actually do the right thing because, A, that's the way you attract more customers and the way you keep your customers. Reputation doesn't seem to affect big banks' market share or profitability at all. RBS, for example, the UK's one of the UK's largest banks, have the worst reputation in terms of customer service. Doesn't it doesn't seem to affect their numbers at all. So this, the normal dynamics of business, as I say, that drives up customer service and drives down prices, doesn't seem to work in the banking sector. So you know, we we've had to put some other measures in place and. We do ultimately need to break through all the big banks so that it's more competitive market, so people can shop around more. Um, but I think that fair business uh, banking, fair banking mark uh, in the business banking world would be a great um, initiative for banks to adopt. It's maybe something we should push harder with them. Mm, I agree. I agree. I think anything that holds. Uh, organizations to account and and that accredits them and audits their behavior and their, their customer service and treating customers fairly has to be a good thing we're going to turn viewers to uh the questions from the community now and there is a fantastic set of them so kevin i hope you're ready i'm going to dive straight in so the first question is um i didn't get the business loan i wanted a few months ago and things have been really difficult this is a situation that so many businesses are facing right now. Um, the question goes on, I was honest in my application, but I don't feel others were as honest. I know you're all about banking fairness. This doesn't feel very fair. Yeah. I don't know the circumstances of the case, but if, if whoever your, uh, your, your constituent is, if you get to drop us a line, um, kevin.holdingrate.mp at parliament.uk, we can pick up particular cases and take them back to the bank's concern. Sometimes the bank's just made an administrative error. Sometimes there's a reason behind that. It could be uh, some credit issue or bounce back loans, for example. There's no requirement for banks to assess credit worthiness, but some of them do assess credit risk for credit check. So it depends on their process. There is a subtle difference there. So um, uh, I'm not saying that's the case in this case, but usually we've got a probably 50 50 chance of getting things resolved if people drop us a line. But I've got to say, generally, bounce back loans have been a huge success. Most people, the banks have moved really quickly, and um, the government rolled it out at pace. There were some wrinkles in the system, the iron and out, it's worked pretty well. So most people are getting access to these loans, but very happy to help any members of your community that, that have, are having problems. Yeah, that, that's really, really useful. And I think also with that, just emphasise the fact that from our community and what we've seen, bounce back loans has been a huge success. It has been something that have been readily available. So, you know, it's kudos really to, to that. It was, it was essential for, for many of our businesses and many of our people in our community. So, you know, we, we really appreciate it. And I think, you know, as you said there, it is sometimes just a case of a few administration glitches here and there that's, that's causing these these problems. So, you know, having that, that ability to kind of talk back or... or speak to someone like yourself is really helpful to businesses um just kind of when we're talking about small businesses and one of the biggest decisions they've got to make is about um their bank so we've got a great question here and it's fantastically put it's as someone who is starting out in business do you have any thoughts on the best bank solution for me um i'm a bit nervous about the newer banks or challenger banks as they're, they're widely termed um are they safe is a big question something that a lot of our clients have been asking us lately uh older banks can be quite slow and old-fashioned 
fashion, do you think banks are even relevant anymore? That's quite a, a huge statement there. With so much finance taking place online, I'm wondering what other options I might have. And I think we have this quite a lot. And as accountants, we, we're constantly asked, which banks do you, do you recommend? And we're obviously not allowed to advise which banks, but we can push them in the right directions. And it is so much for us, it's, much, it's so much more convenient, if you like, to push them towards the challenge of banks because we know clients can get that, that interaction straight away and they can get that decision much quicker and they can get up and running quicker. Is it, you know, how, how do you feel about it at the moment? What, what's your advice to small businesses on that? Well, it's a massive advocate of increasing competition in the marketplace, as I said earlier. So we really like the challenge of banks. Um, I, I like work. I'm a, I'm a Revolut card. I love that kind of stuff. I know that's not a business, business essential, although they're moving into the business space. But people like Tide, Funding Circle, uh, people like Starling, of course. Really exciting stuff they have. It's not just about banking, they integrate with your accounts and all this kind of stuff. So they're really about productivity tool, which is great for me. You know, the less you have to engage with your bank and the more seamless it is, the better. So um, on that really word of caution, which, you know, is very frustrating, is we've encouraged people over the last five years, um, well, the last 10 years probably, since the crisis to try and uh, diversify, move to different banks, and the new banks have started up on the back of that, these uh, non-bank lenders, as I said. Um, so, um, but then the bounce back loans have mainly been distributed through the big banks, which is, a, so if you're a tired customer, and we've been banging on about this with the Treasury, you know, in fact, that we've got this compelling case, coalition of people around it, media, MPs, ministers, and then we banging on, constantly banging on, you've got to get some funding to people like Tide and Funding Circle and Stanley so they can lend money to their customers. So you've got about 250,000 businesses that are with new challenger banks that can't currently get easy access to bounce back loans. So that's the only word of caution. I think we will solve that problem. There's a couple of ways to solve it that we propose to the Treasury. We'll keep banging on about it and haven't solved it yet. We will get there. But given that, aside from that, I think I would definitely consider one of those new challenger banks. Um, but shop around. It's whatever you feel is, is most suits your business, most suits your business model and um, and that's what well, that's what we believe in isn't it you know we as as business people we believe in competition we want the fair and level playing field keep the government out of the way let's get on with it and it's the same with same with banks really we want people to have choice and, and it should be a competitive market to provide that choice that that's great and there are tools of course that can help you compare um, banks and compare the offerings now so you don't have to do it in a vacuum anymore or sort of go around as we would have done sort of 10 or 20 years ago when we were choosing the right bank you, you know these days it is online you can get comparisons and read reviews and find out an awful lot more um, about the bank I'm going to pile straight into the next question Kevin if I may so on the all party parliamentary group website it says that the APPG acts as a forum and focal point for the SME communities and the small business community. I am part of that community and I would love to know more about how the group aims to help us to get a fair deal. How can I get involved? Can I get involved and have my say? Yes, well, listen, we, we, we are delighted to be engaged with you in any way possible. Um, I guess the... Number one thing we've been preoccupied by in terms of the work we've done has been still a legacy dispute from 2008, frighteningly, 12 years later. So we're still banging on about people who are, who are disadvantaged, who are uh, businesses that were stripped, distressed as, uh, as a consequence of the fallout of the last recession. So a lot of our work has been on the dispute resolution side, and you know, we've had a good deal of success there, particularly the people with, who were banked with Lloyds and RBS. So, um, but as well as that, we have webinars on a, on a monthly basis. So we've got one coming up you are delighted to engage with. Uh, we usually get 100 people on there. We get MPs and all kinds of people on there, and, um, and which is about uh, put, you know, coping with COVID. This is about business finance to cope with COVID. What's the next iteration of the bounce back loans? What's the next iteration of, of coronavirus business instruction loans? What about things like forbearance if things go wrong? And we get good people on there. We get people like uh, uh, President of CBI, Lord Villamora. We get uh, John Glenn, the business the uh, economic section of the Treasury. We'll get the regulator on there. 
we get Adam Marshall from the, from the Chambers of Commerce on there. So we have a good range of speakers to talk from different aspects on that. So we have webinars, we've got something, a, a program called Bankers for Net Zero. You can Google, it's all about how we help businesses to transi transition to the new world of net zero and rather than simply leaving businesses behind and maybe on. So it's if you're, let's say you're producing handmade bricks at the moment, I've got one in my constituency, use a lot of gas to do that. How can, is that a bank suddenly going to say, I'm sorry, we're not going to support businesses like yours anymore if you're using too much, uh, too, uh, too much fossil fuel? Um, are we going to help them transition to biofuels, that kind of stuff? And that's what we need banks to do. So we've got lots of programs, projects. Please you know, go on the website, drop us a line, and we'll, we'd be likely to engage with you any way we can. But SMEs are the heart of everything we do. Oh, that's brilliant news. And, you know, I mean, you've, you've said it really well there about the fact that SMEs are at the heart of everything that, that you want to do. And, and I think you, you have harped on about it before, how banks have changed massively lately. Uh, well, in the past couple of years or, or five, ten years, however long it's going to be, from that local community feel to this more of a, of a you know, national decisions and everything that goes with it. So people need that ability to have that conversation and kind of drive the way that things are changing and, and the way it is. And having all those options, like you said, is really powerful. I think, I think that's going to be quite quite useful to small businesses out there. Um, yeah. We've got a really good question here. Now, I think some of it you've already covered in, in some bits, but it might be worth just emphasising for this particular um, member of our community. Um, and it says the terms that banks want from small businesses they have give loans out are really unfair. So again, we don't have the, the, the details to go with it or anything, but you know, just as a generalisation. Uh, four months ago, I had to take out a loan with non-COVID terms as my local bank wouldn't give me the business interruption loan or bounce back loan, and they were ru so rude about my business. It put me off applying to anyone else. It's been so stressful. Can you do something to make banks listen better to small businesses and be more real? Realistic about our circumstances. Yes, um, yes, we can. I mean, you're right. I mean, if you remember the original terms of the coronavirus business interruption loan, that was the only scheme that was rolled out. Remember when it first came out? Is but basically what it said is, you can have one of these loans if the bank won't consider you for a normal loan. So these loans are really good. They're really cheap interest. There's no personal guarantee, or certainly houses actually was it so personal guarantee, but they're, they're better in uh, in all these ways, but you can't have one. You can only have one if, if the bank won't lend you on normal terms. So I would then go to my bank and they say, Oh, you can't have one of those nice, shiny, cheap loans. I want to give you my real and right, really expensive loans with lots of different conditions you're not going to like. So um, we obviously uh, immediately raised these issues uh, with Treasury on the floor of the house saying, This just isn't working. It's, this is a nightmare. It really was a nightmare for three or four weeks. We had Lots of problems, and then they effectively scrapped that rule. It made the uh, business instruction loans much more cost effective and said to the banks, give them these loans for, for first up, so they're cheaper. So it sounds like your, your, uh, one of your members there has um, got one of the old loans, which is really unfair. So um, then, of course, we also banged on about, we were told no demand for the smaller loans. Bounce back loans and uh, no demand. And then anyway, we got that brought forward and we kept really busy talking about that and they brought forward the bounce back loans and not just those other people as well. So Treasury does act, banks do act if we make enough fuss about it. And you've got to make a lot of fuss. And we use the media, we use MPs, we use ministers, we use, we use the banks themselves, we correspond with them, work with them a lot. And then um, we do get the change that we'd like to see. And I think in terms of Treating businesses better, which I think was part of the question. Yes, I think that's back to the dispute resolution mechanisms, financial ombudsman service, and the business bank resolution service means that banks will have to communicate with you properly, will have to treat you properly if things that go wrong, can't just simply stick you into insolvency if they want their money back, all those kind of things, and they'll be judged against this code of conduct. So it means there's the deterrent. And the first time we've got really imperative, other than the court, which is most businesses have not got access to the court against the bank, the first time is a really imperative on banks to treat people well in the first place, which is hopefully people will see uh, more constructive um, 
behaviour from the banks uh, in these situations. So you heard it from, from straight from Kevin's mouth, guys. You need you need to make a lot of noise and a lot of fuss. This is the man to do it for you. So get on that website, get writing to, to Kevin if you need change to happen because he is clearly the man to make the banks and the government listen. Um, that is actually a very reassuring response, Kevin. Thank you. Um, the next question I have is from uh, a, a business owner who has a spa and beauty treatment business which has been very badly hit due to COVID-19 um, and uh, they say we were closed for almost four months had to spend a lot of money on changing how we do things so we could get reopened and now it looks like we're going to face even more hardship um, we were doing really well last year had 30% growth and we're about to open a fourth location now I'm facing shutting down all but one site and letting loads of people go what advice do you have for businesses struggling with funds right now? I wanted to take a loan. I'm terrified of the repayment terms. Are the loans the best place to start or can you suggest alternatives? I mean, that's a big question from somebody who clearly needs some, some really good advice. In an ideal world, they would be going to their bank manager for this advice, wouldn't they, too? Yeah, yes, they would. And um, it's great you've got this kind of network that people can seek advice from people other than their bank manager. And um, this is the third recession I've been through in business. And, um, and it's definitely been the most catastrophic and scary. But also, I've never seen any support like it from the government ever before like this, So, which is the good news. Having said that, that support's likely to come to an end. There's the, this uh, new job support scheme they brought forward that will help keep some people on um, by paying, picking up the share of the tab for the hours uh, if you're working part time rather than working full time, so the first thing I do is try and cut my cloth, uh, cut my coat according to my cloth. So you've got to really try and hunker down wherever you can to cut costs and look. Maybe look for other revenue opportunities. So you've got to, you don't stop the innovation. Business is a brilliant innovation, making things work against all the odds. You've got to continue to do that. You've got to be creative. You've got to keep thinking. Um, yes. Absolutely, there is an issue with some sectors, particularly that are going to be asked to close or be forced to close. Nighttime economy is a good one, uh, an obvious one. Spa and beauty, perhaps they might suffer some greater restrictions. It may be that the Chancellor comes back with some more sector specific schemes, but that's pretty tough to do. If you look, you know, so this, dividing one sector from another is very, very difficult. So I, I wouldn't expect that. I would simply try and I say, cut my coat. And um, so in terms of should I get a loan, well, the, the bounce back loan schemes are very, very cheap. So you can take the biggest loan you can because there's no interest to pay for the first 12 months. So if you think you're in two minds about it, go and get one because you can pay it back within 12 months without penalty, no fees whatsoever. And after that, it's 2.5% and you can pay back over 10 years. So even if you pay it back in two years, you still pay very little interest. So it really is a very affordable way to borrow and the government guarantee step behind it, and there'll be this, this code of conduct. So, yes, it's a last resort getting a loan if you don't like getting into debt, but I would get one just as a bit of cover because you can pay it back without penalty. Yeah, that's great advice, Kevin. Thank you. And I think, you know, to anyone struggling out there, do go get some advice um, on what your options are. Um, and, and do look into the circumstances. Please don't struggle alone. If there is a lifeline in, and you're worried about it, go go find out more to hopefully alleviate that that worry. Um, but but you know, and I know you guys are all doing this anyway. But do whatever it takes to keep your businesses alive. Times will get better. We have to get through this period though. And you know, with with a bit of luck, it, the bounce back loan loan is something that will work for, for your business. Guys, I think we've got time for one more question the producers might shoot me for saying this but Aaron do you want to ask the next one it is a great question I really want you guys to hear the answer to that question certainly Merle yeah and uh, emphasize everything you've just said there about making sure people get the right advice so my bank charged me so this is a question and it may be related to more of their personal side of things but it's worthwhile just bringing up anyway my bank charged me a load of stuff like insurance and discount and things that I didn't need and now I've discovered that that was unlawful and I could have a claim against them I can't keep getting calls from a business that says that they get a load of money back but i don't know if it's a scam or not do you know how this works and if it's true that my bank did was against the law 
But effectively, being found guilty of a succession of scandals is not beyond the bounds of possibility. PPI being an obvious one, um, uh, LIBOR rigging, borrowing exchange, SME, um, asset stripping. So it's, it's, it's more than possible. The, the, what you should do is go to the financial ombudsman service. Don't go to a claims management company. Just go to the financial ombudsman service. It's totally free. They will uh, look at your, your particular case. They should be able to advise whether there's something wrong or not. It won't cost you a penny. And, and it won't fall out with your bank either because the banks pay for the FOS. But it's, it's a, a good service and it's free to you. And if your business is that, if you've got turnover up to six and a half million quid, if it's more than that, it's up to 10 million pounds then you go to the business bank resolution service. And I think I think that's a really important piece of advice as well, guys. I think there's a lot of people anxious about what may be happening, but are terrified, Kevin, of you know, some kind of retaliation from from their bank or some sort of heavy handed treatment or you know saying no to a, a loan application if they ask questions about what what might have been appropriate or lawful or not so i mean it's great to know that the financial ombudsman service is there and that our users and, and consumers customers can uh, look at that and it won't cost them anything so so if you are in the same position as this particular Fewer than Aaron, I'm sure your advice would be the same, is, is go and check out the Financial Ombudsman Services um, website. Thank you so much, Kevin, for uh, being on the show, for subjecting yourself to all of these cracking questions. Uh, no, <laughs> it's great been... questions. It's an absolute pleasure to do it. And uh, invite me back any time. I'd be delighted to help in any way I can. And any, any of you uh, kind of people who uh, access your services on the show are very happy to help. Wonderful, wonderful. Aaron, it's been a brilliant show, hasn't it? Some great questions. I'm very sorry, guys, we've run out of time. and We can't ask any more of them, but do keep them coming in. You heard it from Kevin. He's happy to come back and be interrogated some more later on. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. That's what keeps us going. Keep sending the questions in. I've really enjoyed today, Kevin. Thank you so much for sharing so much information with us. It's been amazing, hasn't it, Aaron? It's been brilliant. Thank you again, Kevin. It's been fantastic. Thank you. My absolute pleasure. Thank you very much. All right, guys. Well, that's all for today's show. But just remember, we're still here. We'll be back with more episodes, more incredible guests like Kevin uh, for you very, very shortly. In the meantime, a massive thanks to Kevin again. Uh, huge thanks, as always, to Aaron and the National Enterprise Network for sponsoring the show. Take care, guys. Go far fast. <laughs>